All right, it's time for my favorite type of assessment, a cardiovascular assessment. This one's gonna be a little hard to keep under 10 minutes, but I will do my best. I'll try to keep it under 20. All right, so who are the key players in the cardiovascular system? So there's the heart, which is the powerhouse, pretty much that's in charge of processing and pushing the blood out. There's also the blood vessels, which of course are our transport system. You know, uh, they pretty much give all of our, the rest of our tissues and cells the, uh, you know, nutrients and oxygen that they need. Um, and then of course the lungs, we can't forget about them because they actually oxygenate that beautiful blood that's pumping through your body. Um, your kidneys, which help to regulate blood pressure and maintain kind of the fluid balance. And then you do have your nervous system, which really helps to turn on and turn off your cardiovascular system. So lots of key players. Um, keep in mind a lot of the stuff I'm going to go through in here. You don't have to know too much in depth um, about some of this, which I'm, if you see me kind of gloss over or go over something quickly, it's just I don't want to get you too confused or too in depth, but I want you to just have some basics ideas um, to kind of understand some of the concepts we're going to talk about. You'll get to do more of this in future semesters though. So anyway, so understanding the way the blood flows will be important, especially when we talk about heart failure. And, you know, the blood comes in um, from the rest of the body after uh, it, it drops off all the oxygen and every all the nutrients and it goes back through the right side of the heart um, the right atrium the right ventricle goes to the lungs and then after the lungs it goes to the left side of the heart and then gets pushed out the aorta to the rest of the body but if you're not familiar with the, the direction that blood flows I would definitely review that of course, the heart has such an important job. It has to have its own blood supply. So there's multiple coronary arteries. And when you get to um, future semesters where you're learning about um, heart attacks and things like that, these will come into play. Um, but effectively, your heart has its own blood supply, which branches off of that um, aorta that comes out of the uh, left ventricle. So your heart has two main functions. It has an, uh, two main um, ways that it functions. Um, one is an electrical. In other words, it, it literally is kind of like a radio signal telling itself, hey, it's time to pump. There's also a mechanical where it has literally physical strength where it has to squeeze. Um, it, so uh, it squeezes or contracts and that's what gets the blood out. And it needs both of these. So if the electrical signal is not working like in dysrhythmias or abnormal heart rhythms, then it's not gonna get the signal or the right signal to pump. Um, and if it's not pumping correctly, even if we're sending that electrical signal and saying, hey, it's time to pump, um, if there's nothing to squeeze it, there's nothing to actually physically get the blood out. So both of these are important. When we talk about electrical problems, we're usually talking about dysrhythmias and things like that. In mechanical problems, we're talking about like heart failure. Um, and if a patient has a heart attack, they can also um, lose that uh, muscle function as well if tissue dies. So what really are the big players? And this is some of the stuff I'm gonna gloss over because I'm gonna talk about it a little bit in class, but I also just wanna kind of introduce you to some of these words. You know, everything in the heart is about cardiac output. In other words, cardiac output is about what is actually, what amount of blood and nutrients and oxygen is getting out of the heart to supply the rest of the body. So I'm gonna talk about just some things, some factors that might come into play. Um, so first and foremost, how much volume um, of blood that you have in your body is going to affect how much you can get out. If you don't have a lot in, you can't get a lot out. Then your heart rate, if your heart rate beats too slow or too fast, it's not going to have enough time to fill. Effectively, the only way you can get blood out is when your heart is having a very momentary, because it's always working, very momentary rest. When it's having that rest, it's filling up with beautiful blood. And so we need that time to rest. But again, if we're resting too much and not squeezing enough, off, then we're also not going to get enough blood out. We'll talk more about that, but effectively we don't want our heart rate to be too slow or too fast. So some other things that can affect um, the amount of blood you can get out of your cardiac output are going to be your age, how in shape you are and things like that, of course. Um, there can be hormonal things, but um, you know, a lot of it's going to be about you know, how well your heart is functioning. Like if you have any heart disease and things like that, it can make it where your heart can't squeeze that blood the way that it wants to. And there's two other factors that we talk about called preload and afterload. So, you know, pretty much what this is preload is think about how much blood you have in your body. Think about how hydrated that you are. Effectively, how much blood is getting back to the beautiful right side of your heart so that it can oxygenate it, get out the left side of your heart and give it to the rest of your body as delicious nutrients and oxygen. So we, we always need to know like kind of what the person's fluid status is. Even if the person's heart is pumping awesome and it's super strong and muscular, if they don't have any 
thing in the tank to squeeze, it's not gonna, it's gonna be a moot point. So we always wanna know about fluid status in cardiac patients. Then we're also gonna be worried about their blood vessel status, what afterload is. Afterload has nothing to do with the heart, it has to do with the blood vessels. It's pretty much, you know, think about patients that have hypertension or other disorders that constrict their blood vessels and think about trying to pour like a jug of milk into a funnel, you know, a really skinny funnel. So you can, if you have a big jug of milk, you can have tons of fluid, you could have tons of pressure, but if you're trying to pour milk into a skinny funnel, it's going to take longer and there's going to be a lot of resistance. So what afterload is, is how much resistance does the heart have to fight against to pump this beautiful blood to the rest of the body? So, um, you know, effectively those two factors, how much volume do we have like to work with? Like how much fluid is in your tank? And then afterload, how much resistance do I have to fight against to get that beautiful blood out to the rest of the body? So those are two factors that we're going to talk about. There's also a whole bunch of nervous system interaction. You know, there's all these receptors, you know, you hear about people passing out on the toilet. That's because the body is so smart, you know, the cardiovascular system, and it compensates when they think there's too much pressure. But there's all these receptors that you have throughout your body called baroreceptors, chemoreceptors, and they're pretty much changing, um, responding to chemicals, to pressure, to any sort of, um, you know, stimulus that's telling them, hey, something's not working right. And then it tells your cardiovascular system, since it's a boss, you know, hey, this this, this is um, what you need to do here. We need to fix this. So just realize you don't need to know these in depth, but just understand there's a lot of chemicals and receptors in your body that are helping your cardiovascular system to respond. Of course, there's also the blood vessels and, you know, there's arteries and veins and arteries, you know, we'll talk about here in a second, but, you know, that's that oxygen rich blood. And then veins are the, after they, um, all the oxygen, everything gets dropped off. It's the blood returning to the heart that's ready to get reoxygenated and go back out. So this is where a lot of the magic happens for, you know, um, getting your tissues, uh, everything that it needs to supply um, and get you moving, get you thinking, get you wondering how crazy I am right now in love with cardiac. That's what, that's all because you have beautiful arteries and veins. So, you know, arteries are a more high pressure system. They're really, you know, they're, um, they have a, a different kind of makeup. They're uh, very um, like a, the kind of tissue that they're made of. They're much more um, strong and they contract and um, they uh, constrict and dilate in response to, um, you know, it can be to medications, to those chemo receptors and other things we just talked about. Um, you know, they respond to a lot of things. So, you know, your arteries are um, very sensitive to changes and things in your body. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about, about a lot of medications that can open those arteries or close them when we talk about hypertension medications. Then in veins, they're a low pressure system. So there's a lot of volume. They're trying to get that blood back to the heart um, and prevent the blood from going backwards, um, but pretty much they're, they're less stressed. Like they're not responding to as much outer things. They're just pretty much a channel to get the blood back to the heart so that you can, you know, re-oxygenate it and get some, it somewhere else. Um, and keep in mind with the veins, one thing to know is that um, veins, um, you know, they need, um, they're, since they're a low pressure, they don't have a lot of squeeze. Um, you know, the muscles in your legs do a lot of overdrive to kind of push and kind of um, push that blood back up to your heart since it's going against gravity a lot of the times. Um, and um, as we're walking and things like that, it literally squeezes to kind of keep blood flowing in the right direction and also get that blood back up to your heart. So this will come in play and be very important when we talk talk about blood clots and other um, venous disorders. So what kind of questions do we want to ask a cardiac patient? So first, of course, we want to ask them about symptoms that they're maybe not getting enough blood flow to their heart. So chest pain, shortness of breath, when does it happen? What makes it better or worse? Um, do they smoke or drink? How much and how often? Because um, smoking and drinking can very much negatively affect the heart. <clears throat> have you noticed any swelling in your feet, ankles, or legs? This can be a sign of heart failure. Um, if the um, body's not able to move blood in the right direction or move fluid in the right direction, then um, they can, it, it can end up backing up. Um, how many pillows do you sleep with at night? And this is something we talked about with respiratory, but, um, you know, effectively, if they're having to sleep on extra pillows, it might be that um, they are uh, retaining fluid or fluids moving backwards, like in heart failure. Um, and so that might be causing uh, them to not be able to breathe adequately, especially when they're lying flat. So this can kind of tell us about how they're functioning with that. 
If you wake up in the middle of the night having to urinate, that's another sign of heart failure. History of sleep apnea. Sleep apnea um, has very, very negative effects on your cardiac health. Um, it can actually lead to sudden cardiac death. So um, knowing about any uh, sort of sleep apnea is super helpful to prevent complications. Um, dizziness, feeling lightheaded. A lot of times, I mean, there's a lot of reasons you can be dizzy or lightheaded, but one of the, um, you know, we always need to rule out a cardiac cause because it can be related to their blood pressure or maybe a medication they're on. Um, we always want to know what medications they're taking because we're going to talk here in a second that there's a lot of medications that can cause a patient to, um, that, that interact with the cardiovascular system and can cause problems. And then what do you do for a living and how much stress are you currently under? And I know that everyone who's reading this is saying a lot, <laughs> especially from reading this past PowerPoint. Um, but, um, you know, effectively, you just want to know about where they're starting because stress has a huge effect on the cardiovascular system. So speaking about medications that can interact with the cardiovascular system, a lot of the um, psychiatric medications can interact with it. Um, steroids can interact with it because it affects the hormones in your fluid and electrolyte balance. Um, contraceptives can put you at risk for blood clots and other cardiovascular disease. Um, NSAIDs, um, you know, um, aspirin is heart healthy and used to prevent a lot of these things, but other NSAIDs can lead to um, similar problems and they mess with your kidneys, which can uh, mess with your regulation of a lot of your cardiovascular system. And sadly, I know you're going to hate to hear this, but all cocaine and amphetamines are just not good for the heart. It actually can lead to heart disease, um, what we call vegetation, uh, or uh, effectively where you get bacteria in your heart. Um, and it also overworks your heart. It actually has an effect on your nervous system, um, really causing a lot of problems. So sadly, there's not really ever a time in this class where I'm going to tell you cocaine is advised. But, um, you know, as a whole, um, you know, this is something that a lot of young people that have heart problems come in with. Um, and then the tricyclic antidepressants, which are sometimes used, of course, for mood disorders, but they're also used um, for nerve pain and other things. So um, just knowing those some of those side effects. So, you know, to start your physical assessment, you want to take the vital signs. Um, you need to know what a normal blood pressure is, and there's the little table there for you. And it used to be 120 over 80 was normal, but now, um, you know, 120 over 80 is actually considered prehypertension. Uh, if we're worried about, um, you know, them, if they're feeling like dizzy, lightheaded, we'd like, usually like to get a set of orthostatic vitals, which means we kind of have them lay down, get their vital signs, sit up on the side of the bed, get their vital signs, stand up, get their vital signs, and see if there's a difference. Um, that systolic blood sh uh, pressure should not um, decrease by more than 20 points, and that heart rate should not increase by more than 20 points. So we're kind of looking at those numbers and making sure that the blood pressure is not going down and the heart rate's not going up when they change position. It shouldn't be that big of a difference between those positions. Um, a normal heart rate is 60 to 100. Um, and um, less than 60 is not necessarily abnormal. We'll talk about it in class about how some people that's healthy and normal for them, but it just depends on the patient. Um, and then the oxygen saturation, you guys always learn 95 and above, but for most people in the real world, 90 to 100 is normal. But, you know, in perfect nursing school world, we want everyone to be above 95. But generally, SpO2 normal is seen as 92 to 100 percent is normal. Um, and the resp normal respiratory rate is 12 to 20. So we also want to um, inspect their skin. Um, pale skin can be a sign they're not getting good blood flow. Um, is there any pulsations in the neck? Is there any JVD? Like in this picture, you can see this woman, she's got a very dilated neck vessel. That's usually a sign of heart failure or backup of fluid into the other blood vessels. Look at the chest. You know, is it symmetrical? Um, are there any abnormalities, any pulsations, drains devices they might have related to their cardiac system? Um, and then we want to look at the fingers and see if there's clubbing or splinter hemorrhages. And I've got some pictures of those. So we want to look for, um, you know, any sort of cyanosis. Um, you know, are their fingers the color they're supposed to be? Are they pale? Are they blue? They really shouldn't be that. <laughs> you know, they should be warm, pink. Um, and then also looking for signs of central cyanosis around their, their mouth um, for that blue color. And then looking at the fingers, um, splinter hemorrhages are sign of um, poor perfusion to the fingers, as well as this clubbing. And this is that little test that you can do where you can put your fingers together and see you should have a window where you can look, you know, in between here and this little, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, there should be a, um, an angle where you can look through. But if you have clubbing, you're not going to have that angle. And that's just another sign of poor long term perfusion. Um, in the real world, we do not palpate the carotid. I know you guys learn this sometimes in assessment and stuff like that, but you should never be touching someone's carotid unless they had carotid surgery and you are a trained, you know, cardiac nurse. 
Um, if you palpate the carotid, they can pass out, especially never palpate bilaterally at the same time. That's like just saying, here, let me cut off the blood flow to your brain. Um, so um, even as a cardiac ICU nurse, I have palpated only a few carotids in my life. One, if I didn't think a patient had a pulse, and two, if they had carotid surgery. So this is not something we routinely do. We check other pulses, and we'll talk about those. Um, we are going to palpate for sternal markers to know where and when to listen to. Um, and we want to palpate what's called the point of maximal impulse or PMI. And we want to see if there's any sort of vibration or forceful push. So if I put my hand down at that point of maximal impulse, I shouldn't feel the heart literally shoving my hand off. And I shouldn't feel like a vibration. It should just feel like the normal heartbeat. Um, we're going to listen for sounds and this is something that takes time and I always say like I like to call um, BS when I hear nurses like say that they're describing this really intense murmur and stuff like that. These things are really hard to hear even as an experienced nurse, but pretty much what you're listening for is a lub dub and you want it to have that regular rhythm lub dub lub dub and the things that are going to be abnormal is if there's something extra like lub lub dub lub dub lub 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 dub or if it's irregular like that. Um, and so you don't have to know too in depth, <clears throat> excuse me, in depth about a lot of these. Um, you're not going to be able to identify them um, by listening to them, at, especially at a novice level. But you really want to know, you really at this level want to be able to identify when something's abnormal, if there's something um, that, you know, if it's, you know, irregular, like I was just mentioning, or a murmur a lot of times sounds like a whoosh, like whoosh, 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 instead of lubbed up. And so you're, that's the kind of stuff you're looking for. Um, or a friction rub, which kind of sounds like sandpaper. Um, um, you know, grating against, um, you know, a surface, um, any sort of abnormal sounds like clicks, snaps, and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> when we're doing a vascular assessment, we want to look at all four extremities. We want to look for symmetry, which means are they the same size and shape? Um, is the color the same? Um, we always want to compare bilaterally. Um, pallor can be a sign that, um, you know, they're getting uh, not getting enough blood flow. And then the redness can be that, hey, maybe they're having like a venous issue. The blood is pooling in their feet. And I'll have a picture on the next slide. Um, you wanna see their hair distribution, if they're missing hair or they don't have hair on their legs, it could be sign that they're not getting blood flow, which is why their hair is not growing. Can you see any edema? Is there any of that clubbing or any lesions present? So, um, you know, when someone has poor perfusion to their legs, when they elevate them, um, it's going to make it even harder. So they may get kind of this like pallor or pale um, color to them. And then when they're dependent, if they have like a venous issue, like where their blood's not pump, um, their legs aren't pumping that blood back up to the heart very well, um, then a lot of times it can actually get red because all the blood is pooling to the foot. But you can see there's some ulcers here. We want to do a good palpation to see what's the temperature and put, compare that bilaterally. The pulses, um, we want to palpate, um, you know, usually we do the radial pulse and then we also do the dorsalis pedis, which is the top of the foot and the posterior tibial, tibial which is the inside. So think in, inward, not the outside, but the inside ankle right around behind that ankle bone. Um, we want to know, is it regular? Is there a regular beat to it? We just feel for a few seconds, you don't need to count it for a full 60 seconds or anything unless the patient has some reason you need to do that. Um, and then we rate it. Most people are going to be normal. You know, a weak pulse means like it's taken me a little bit to find it or I can feel it, but I really have to kind of work at it or move my hand around to feel it. Um, it's not, you know, reliable. And then a bounding, you know, can mean um, pretty much that, um, you know, I, uh, what do you call it? It's literally pushing my hand up um, or I don't even have to touch it. I'm just looking at it and I can see it. Um, we also want to get capillary refill, which is where you push on the nail. And a lot of people think you have to push on just the nail. You can look as long as you're pushing on the fingertip, you can, um, some people have really nasty nails in the hospital. You can just point on the, um, put your uh, push down on the outside of the finger. Um, and just what you're looking for is a return of color. It should turn white because you're putting pressure. And then when you let go, it should return to that pink color. That pretty much tells you you're getting blood flow. Um, and then pitting and non-pitting edema. So like when, if I have edema and I push into someone's leg and let go, if my finger mark is still there, that's pitting edema. Whereas other edema, like my finger marks don't stay in it, but um, I can tell that it's swollen. And then I rate, I rate it. Is it just trace like a little bit, just barely there? Is it mild? Is it moderate or severe? So this is kind of a picture of some pitting edema versus um, some just regular edema that's maybe non-pitting. 
So there's also a lot of diagnostic tests. So we want to um, <clears throat> understand that there's some cardiac biomarkers which show damage to the heart, troponin and CKMB, which pretty much says, hey, part of the heart cells are dying, which in that sad story, heart cells should never die. Um, there's also the BNP. And don't get this confused with the BM as in Mark P. So BN as in Nancy P is um, you know, pretty much telling us about fluid volume status. Is, is there excess stretch or fluid on the heart? And we do this as a, um, as a measure to look for heart failure to see if the patient's overloaded or if they're in an acute heart failure exacerbation. Um, we also want to check lipid levels, the HDL, LDL, triglycerides, and cholesterol. And for all of these, the LDL, triglycerides, and total cholesterol, we want them to be low. The HDL, it's the H, remember H for healthy, we actually want those to be high. So HDLs we want to be high, LDLs we want to be low. Um, other labs, we might get kidney function testing or some electrolytes. Um, we might also get some imaging, so a chest x-ray, um, see is the heart in the right place, how big is it, um, an electrocardiogram, um, and you know, it's going to tell us the electricity of the heart, so it's going to tell us, you know, um, what's the rhythm, um, is the heart sending the correct electrical signals. An echocardiogram is a visualization of the heart's pumping, so that's going to be more of looking at the mechanical function of the heart. Are the valves working? How much blood in the heart is able to get out? Is there any infection? action. Um, and there's what's called a TEE, um, uh, a transesophageal echocardiogram versus a TTE, which is a, um, a transthoracic echocardiogram. So one is they go in with a scope, you know, that's the TEE, they go in with a scope and they look at the heart through the esophagus. How cool is that? And then there's the TTE, which is the one you probably see most of the time, which is where they kind of turn them on their left side and look at their heart from the outside. Um, there's also stress testing, um, which um, there's like a, you can take, um, give, like you can be given a medication or put on a treadmill, depending on your abilities and see what happens when the heart gets stressed. And there's also like recorders. Sometimes, you know, you're at the doctor and you swear something's going on, um, but they can't seem to catch it. They can't seem to see that it's happening. So, um, you know, pretty much what a Holter monitor or a loop recorder does is it kind of monitors your heart when you're not at the doctor's for, um, you know, a period of time to see if you're having any abnormalities. Um, a six minute walk test is telling you like your activity tolerance, how that's going. And then we also do ultrasounds of the peripheral extremities to look for blood clots and for overall blood flow. So this is kind of, um, you know, a side-by-side uh, -side of a normal and abnormal chest x-ray. Can you tell which one is normal? This one's more normal. So look at this big heart. Look at how much of that lung, that heart is taken up. This is a heart failure patient. We'll talk more about that. Um, <clears throat> then these are some other devices. Here's an EKG. Um, here's someone getting an echo. It's one of those external echoes and then some stress testing and um, Holter monitors and things like that to record um, the rhythm that the person's in just to kind of give you a visual. There's also procedures that you can do have done to your heart. Um, we'll talk a lot about the cardiac catheterization, which is where we can go in and just look to see what's going on. How well is the heart getting perfused? Is there blockages? But we can also perform interventions. Um, and, um, you know, the, the specific one, the type of catheterization that's specific to the coronary arteries is called coronary angiography. Um, there's also, you know, if the electrical system is having a problem, we can do um, EP studies or electrophysiology studies where they can literally burn off pathways. If your heart's not sending a cool signal, they can kind of try to change it or reset it. Um, and then there's cardiac surgery, valve replacements, open heart surgeries um, for um, arterial disease in the legs. They can do a bypass where they bypass a blood vessel that's maybe blocked. And then if you're having a lot of blood clots, they can also put in what's called an IVC filter. So this is just a picture of before and after. You can see there's a big old blockage here with a circle and look what happens. Beautiful, the things they can do in the cath lab. So yeah, and this is just kind of showing some different pictures of some different procedures in cath lab and they effectively are going in and trying to restore blood flow to the most important organ in your body, your heart. And so um, just some pictures of some different things they can do. They have really cool valve replacements these days that you can go in without even cutting the person's chest open. You can go in and um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, replace that valve. Here's the femoral popliteal bypass surgery and this is a cabbage and a, um, uh, what do you call it, a uh, IVC filter placement. This is the old traditional valve replacement. But um, a lot of the stuff you're not going to get into until later semesters, but I just wanted to show it to you because it's so cool. Don't worry. I'll narrow down the stuff that's important to know at this level. 
And that's all I got. And I kept it under 25 minutes, which I say is pretty darn good. So um, thanks so much for listening to me. And I'll see you for some fun in cardiac class. Bye.